Back in the 90s, there were a lot of plans for shows based on comic book characters, but most of these plans were held back because it would be too expensive to pull off each episode featuring our favorite heroes. It might seem like a joke nowadays, considering that we get to see a series based on some Disney property every other day. Following the success of the 1994 film The Crow, many sequels were spawned, with each one failing to live up to the original take. But then there was a TV series based on the 1994 movie that gave us more insight into the character's world. Let's look at The Crow, Stairway to Heaven, and how it gave us the best interpretation of the comic book character after Brandon Lee's take on the role. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Genesis and Development of The Crow, Stairway to Heaven Based on the James O'Barr graphic novel, The Crow, Stairway to Heaven was a Canadian drama TV series based on the 1994 film The Crow. While the movie is among the best comic book adaptations ever, it gave us Brandon Lee's brilliant performance as the tragic character. Mark Dacascos was given the titular role, and it was perfect casting, considering he had been doing martial arts roles to establish himself in Hollywood, while the 1994 movie became infamous for the onset accident that took the life of Brandon Lee. The series also suffered casualty when stuntman and actor Mark Akerstream died of a head injury, but the series was canceled after one season as Universal bought out Polygram Productions and canceled it even though production on season 2 had already begun. The executive producer for the show, Bryce Zabel, had plans to revive the show but to no avail. Later, he would attempt to make a TV movie to conclude the series, but even that plan didn't come to fruition. The positive ratings and the good number of views make it a worthy interpretation of the world of the crow and an exciting take on the character. Exploring the inception and conclusion. Let's check out the individual episodes of the series, how they differ from the movie, and how they sometimes go beyond the source material. The first two episodes primarily focus on the film's plot, as Eric exacts revenge on the gang that ruined his life and gave him a whole new purpose. Unlike the movie, this show has visuals that are very much inspired by the comics, but even then, the show explores the characters in the spirit world. The first episode, titled The Soul Can't Rest, puts us right after the events that led to the protagonist's dilemma. We see Eric in the spirit world, and he is looking for Shelly. When he comes across a bridge, he sees Shelly on the other end and runs towards her to hug her. Shelly tells him that they are in the land of death, but the fact that they are together is all that matters. He tells her about the crow that led him to her, but then Shelly tells him that this crow will give him a second chance, and he needs to set things right. She starts disappearing, but Eric tries to catch her and instead falls off the bridge. Following this, we see Eric land in the land of the living, right in the middle of a party with people preparing for Halloween. A man looking very much like the Skull Cowboy appears and explains that Eric has crossed from the land of the dead to the land of the living. The next day, we see Sarah going to Shelley's grave to give flowers, but she is not alone. Albrecht is following her, trying to look out for her. As she put a flower on Eric's grave, a crow lands on his grave. Meanwhile, Eric comes across the first case, where he witnesses a man pushing around a woman to get in his car, and Eric decides to intervene. Eric manages to put down the man and asks the woman to leave. As the man asks him who he is, he responds cryptically, he's nobody, just like the man. As Albrecht takes Sarah to school, they spot Tintin on the way, and Albrecht decides to go and have a chat. The detective mentions the death of Eric and Shelley, but Tintin walks off. Eric has a flashback of Shelley as he spots a guitar at Gideon's pawn shop while Gideon tells him that he cannot afford the guitar. The guitar reminded him of when he performed a song for Shelly, and she was so smitten by it. Conveniently, we see T-Bird and his gang watching a videotape of Eric and Shelly, and suddenly, the gang runs in to attack them. Top Dollar was inspecting the video, and he realizes the mistake Funboy makes in the video when he mentions one of the gang members' names as they intended to make the death of the couple look like a suicide. Still, the authorities are clear about the case being a double homicide. Tintin tells them that Albrecht is still after him, but Top Dollar has other plans, and asks him to set up a meeting with the detective so that they can tell him about the other men involved in the homicide case. Now, we witness the transformation scene as Eric reaches his apartment, which has remained untouched for a year, and sees a picture of him and Shelley, which brings back painful memories. Then, we see him transform into the Dark Avenger that we know, as he bleeds through his eyes and creates the pattern around his eye, and then he heads out to set things right. 
following this event, everything lines up very similar to the movie, as Eric goes to Gideon to get back the guitar, which was initially his. When Gideon pulls a gun on him, he manages to thrash him to get back his stuff. Later, he goes to Fun Boy and discovers Darla, Sarah's mother, and gives them individual treatments based on what they deserve. One must wonder if this is the end of the movie concept, but no. He hasn't been involved with the events of the Blackout Club yet, but unlike the movie, Eric doesn't kill Top Dollar here. Instead, he makes him suffer through the pain of the other victims of Top Dollar by absorbing it from his weapons. However, the same doesn't happen in the case of Mace Reyes, the person primarily responsible for what happened to Eric. In the second episode, we see a much more exciting development in the arc of the primary characters as the bond between Albrecht and Eric develops. Later in the episode, he finds out that Mace Reyes did all this because the love between Eric and Shelly would have made him too powerful, and that's why he ensured that Shelly got stuck in purgatory while Eric got stuck in the land of the living. Mace Reyes succumbs when India wounds the snake that Mace used to go around with. The third episode is the first time we encounter events that take the plot beyond Eric's hunger for justice for the events that led to his present condition. Things take an exciting turn when he faces eviction from his place, but he realizes that this loft is a gateway between him and Shelly. The only way for them to communicate with each other is via this gateway, and that's why he has to figure out a way so that he can keep the play. He also finds a job as a bouncer for the Blackout Club. Meanwhile, he is given a case to solve when Shelly reaches out to him after her interaction with Elise Franklin, who got killed and reached the spirit world. According to the girl, her boyfriend was being held responsible for her murder, but that wasn't the case. And that's what was happening in the real world as Albrecht interrogated her boyfriend, Gil. Eric decides to take matters into his own hand and tries to figure out who had the real motive for the kill and find out it was Elisa's father, John Franklin himself. This episode lays out a fascinating premise for Eric's future adventures since he is stuck in the living world even after he managed to take his revenge on Top Dollar. During one of his conversations with Sarah, he indicates that he wishes just to collect merit badges, which we will see him do as he comes across various exciting characters while doing this. Episode 20 As the series came close to its unfortunate ending, it did manage to explore some exciting plots. The very first among them is the 20th episode, Brother's Keeper, where we see Eric come across his stepbrother, played by none other than the 90s genre regular, Corey Feldman. Like Hamlet, our hero gets a vision of his stepfather, who appears and gives him an insight into his childhood, which involves a particular memory associated with his stepbrother. As he follows these visions, he discovers that his brother is in trouble, as some goons are beating him up, and he is feeling the pain and motion associated with his stepbrother. Meanwhile, Albrecht tries to figure out what's wrong with Capshaw, as the latter experiences PTSD from the time she got shot in her leg. Eric manages to save his brother when goons kidnap the latter, but Chris, Eric's brother, isn't ready to accept how his brother found him. Chris's reaction makes sense, considering Eric keeps saying that their father helped him, supposedly while serving in Vietnam but Chris thinks their father is still alive, and the goons have paid Eric to make Chris blurt out his secret. Finally, Eric reveals what happened to him in the past few months, including his death in Shelly, which makes Chris open up about the goons and why they are after him. According to him, they are after him to find the location of some money that Chris's cellmate told him about. Eric decides to help him, but ensures these goons don't get a chance to kill him. But Chris, being the stupidest brother ever, goes for the money himself and gets caught in a trap laid by the goon. They get hold of him and the money. But just when they are about to kill him, Eric enters. He takes his form, and Cardosa, the leader of these goons, shoots him only to see him heal. Then Eric lets out one of his heroic dialogues before unleashing his wrath on the goon. You see, now you've put a hole in my favorite shirt. But when he is done with them, he discovers that Chris has gone somewhere again. Back at Eric's loft, Chris waits for Eric to come so that they can talk about what happened to their father. Eric takes their father's tag in their hands, and they see what happened to him. They find out that during the family's evacuation from Vietnam, their father sacrificed his seat for another woman and her child. This vision gives them the necessary explanation, meaning Chris will probably finally change his way of life. Episode 21 The next episode features a significant appearance by another of the 90s teenage movie legends. Anthony Michael Hall. He plays someone who uses women as bait so that he can get a cop to come to the rescue and kill them. As the authorities start investigating the case of the cop killer, Albrecht goes to Eric for help. However, Eric is going through something significant as he struggles to take control of himself when the crow takes over him. Yes, 
a major Hulk thing is happening with our friend Eric Draven. Returning to his usual self becomes difficult whenever the Crow takes over Eric. Albrecht's lieutenant, Vincennes, gives a statement to the press regarding the cop killer, saying that he will be caught by any means necessary. Doing this makes him the next target for our cop killer, as he goes ahead and kidnaps his wife. Earlier, Albrecht handed Eric a button found at the crime scene the last time to get a vision of the accused but Eric failed to do so. Eric assumes it is because he is trying to fight being taken over by the crow, but suddenly he gets a vision and realizes that he can contribute. Vincennes receives a call from the kidnap and decides to send his kids to the precinct for their safety. As a sudden twist, back at the precinct, we see Anthony Michael Hall as one of the officers. Meanwhile, Eric goes to the last victim of the killer and tries to get her help to get an idea of the criminal. This time in his vision, he sees a police badge and realizes that this person is a cop. Eric updates Albrecht, and the latter teams up with Capshaw to figure out that this officer is none other than one Reed Truax. Meanwhile, Vincennes gets another call from the kidnapper and decides to go to the location he mentioned all by himself. Before going, he leaves some of his belongings back, and Albrecht uses these belongings to take Eric's help to track him down. The duo reaches the warehouse, but Albrecht asks Eric to hold back because he doesn't want Vincennes to know he works with Eric. As Albrecht finds Reed Truax, the latter is holding Vincennes' wife hostage which puts him in a dilemma. The crow takes over Eric, and he enters and attacks Reed. He is about to give him a final blow before a vision of Reed's childhood appears, and Eric decides to hold back. The episode hints at Eric struggling with himself and his identity when the crow takes over, leaving it without proper exploration. This plot device is something even Spider-Man 2 explored, but needed to give a chance to grow correctly, thus making the series very safe compared to the original themes of the graphic novel and the movie. The series' final episode gives us a moment that many fans of superheroes or anti-hero characters have wished to see. In the prologue to the episode, we see James Horton disguised as Draven, using just a wig, getting hold of the crow. The disguise feels like it was just for us and not the crow but it still managed to fool the crow. He is planning for another ritualistic resurrection of a crow and utters the dialogue, I love a good resurrection, to start the events of the episode. Eric comes across Giddy, who has changed his ways and sells hot dogs, since he thinks pawn shops tend to take things away, but now he can give back this way. Albrecht goes to investigate some bloodstains on Eric's gravestone, but an extremely nervous Judge Morrison appears and asks for protection. Back at Balsam's estate, we see how Balsam managed to transfer his soul to a younger body, that of his trainer, James Horton. The resurrection finally occurs, and another body in Eric's crow form emerges from his grave. He goes to Funboy's prison cell and kills him. Casey appears in the land of the dead and asks Shelly if she can help Eric if he needs it. Albrecht investigates by questioning Morrison as a member of the Lazarus Group. Many exciting events occur one after the other, indicating that something big will go off soon. When Shelly wakes up, Eric is back at his place, sleeping in front of a fireplace. The couple reconciles and decides to make the most of this moment, as Eric feels this might be a dream. Back at Balsam's estate, we get to see his actual plans as Eric's crow form appears, and he finds that he is the one who resurrected him, and he holds the crow hostage to control him. His first task is to bring Judge Morrison before the latter spews out more of his plan. According to Morrison, Balsam successfully developed the technology to transfer his soul to a younger body. After destroying it, he wanted to kill everyone who knew about it. Eric uncovers this plan and comes across this new resurrection to fight it, but since he can bleed, his crow form manages to defeat him. Then Shelly becomes a channel between them to transfer the crow form back to him. While Eric is unconscious, Shelly goes away with Casey, but while traveling back to the land of the dead, she realizes she cannot leave Eric again and jumps off the bridge. Yes, that's where the episode ends, and it leaves a lot of questions to be answered and a lot of things to be found out, but also, in a way, it seems like an ending that goes towards a happy one, but not exactly. Key cast and characters of The Crow, Stairway to Heaven. Now that we have seen the series' basic plot, let's examine the various characters who appear and how they differ from the 1994 film and even the graphic novel. Eric Draven, The Crow. Even though the origin story is similar in all the cases, Mark Dacascos makes the character entirely his own. The character's physicality as The Crow works out well in this case, and he gives in to the madman. This interpretation comes very close to Brandon Lee's take on the role, but the idea that the makeup is something that grows out of him like a transformation 
becomes a bit weird, considering both the comics and the movie saw him applying the makeup on his face. The fact that this happens by itself becomes a bit funny during the scenes where we see him switch between the two personas quite rapidly. Since the series allows a lot of ground to play with the character, we get to see a version that works in this world, even though certain character elements are left unexplored, even though there are hints at it. Even though the show sometimes falls flat, Mark Dacascos' take on the character must be among his best works. We shouldn't be surprised that John Wick found him to be a considerable opponent in John Wick 3. Daryl Albrecht Daryl Albrecht had a shorter role in the original movie, but ended up being a Jim Gordon-like character to Eric's Batman. Even though his primary work revolves around the crow, he manages to stand out with his detective work and his dedication in his field. It is not sure if he accepts all the supernatural events during the series, but he manages to ensure the culprit doesn't get away. Often it might feel like the protagonist helps out the police, but in the case of Albrecht, the detective doesn't sit back and only reaches out to Eric with the utmost urgency. Mark Gomez's take on the character only improves on Ernie Hudson's take, making the character a lot more memorable and an essential part of the Crow's arc. Shelley Webster The original story in the movie didn't have much use for Shelley. Still, we see an exciting development for her as she becomes Eric's contact at Purgatory, using the broken window at Eric's loft as a gateway. She even comes to help Eric when he faces his spirit as an enemy and helps him get it back. Even though it is not clarified if she manages to return to the land of the living, in the end, her attempt at not leaving Eric again fills us with hope. There are times in the series when she contributes to the plot a lot more than we would have expected her to. Her return indicates that things will now return to normal, but the duo might face a new enemy now that they have opposed the natural way of life. Sarah Moore Katie Stewart's take on Sarah is a little different from her original appearance in the graphic novel or the movie. Sarah becomes a close friend of Eric, but even then, she doesn't have many appearances in the series except for times when she is essential to the plot. Her presence impacts this rendition of Eric Draven when he is about to kill Top Dollar, but she tells her that Shelley might not want this preventing him from going through with his revenge. Doing this becomes a pivotal plot point in the entire series, as it keeps Eric in control of his person when the crow takes over. If she hadn't prevented him, we would have had a much more gritty version of the character, like the one in the movies and the comic book. Hannah Foster, Talon Hannah Foster makes her debut in the 15th episode of the series, playing the first female rendition of the crow in the franchise. Her tragic origin story is associated with her daughter's death, when the duo was held captive in an attic and died of thirst. Hannah had to suffer more since her daughter died before her, and she only died three days after that. Even though Eric and Hannah don't precisely team up, the duo learn from each other's situation and try to accept their present state of being accordingly. Bobby Phillips proves to be a worthy addition and gives an interesting take on the female rendition of the character. Exploring its impact relevant, and personal reflection. The Crow, Stairway to Heaven, is an exciting take on the character's arc and manages to build a world filled with its character. Some of the elements are very much inspired by the various superheroes we are aware of, but still, it tries to create an exciting amalgamation when it comes to the take on the world of the Crow. Often, it does feel as if certain things are dragged on for no reason, but since the episodes are 45 minutes to an hour long, it makes sense that they approach this take on the story. If someone compares the series to the 1994 movie, then the series falls flat, considering the movie is one of the best adaptations of the comic book material. The original story was a lot more dark and gritty, and the series avoids these elements and brings a lot more light to the tone. Even the show's look is a lot brighter compared to the dark aesthetic the 1994 interpretation went for. No one can deny how much Mark Dacascos brings to the character with his martial arts skill and takes on the various layers that the character explores throughout the episode. Certain storylines, trying to fit the TV show trope, ended up feeling a bit too lame. For example, the one scenario when he gets tried for the murder of Shelley. Other stories are a lot more interesting when they try to explore the lore behind his resurrection, and the villains explore that to utilize it for their selfish purposes. The music ends up being a bonus, with each episode having a particular theme, indicating that they invested in that aspect considering Eric was a musician. The series kept the original theme from the movie, and it works since the heartbreak and the pain are carried through here. Since the show was at the height of the 90s, we get to witness some significant actors appear here in tiny roles. The series makes for a great follow-up to the 1994 movie and manages to keep the world and its elements intact. It would be amazing to see a reboot of this series in the modern day with Mark Dacascos returning to the role, bringing us back to the world that the show managed to establish, with a new take on the source material coming out soon.
It is exciting to see how crazy this character's world can get with the series. There are rumors that the new movie will be a unique take on the story, but fans of this series won't mind Mark DeCascos appearing just to give him a fitting in to his take on the character. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.